Hello and welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone to Inside the Avatar Studio, Season 4. We're going to be experimenting with new format options over the next several months, and we're hoping that everyone will enjoy the new features as we have a dynamic array of guests lined up starting this season. Inside the Avatar Studio brings together innovative leaders from the virtual technology frontier to discuss perceptions, perspectives, and predictions of what being virtual means in today's society. Guest speakers discuss current issues and trends surrounding implications of their virtual experiences based on their own areas of subject matter expertise. This new segment, which we call Percept uh, Perceptions, will provide information on news and collaborations happening where Rockcliffe is contributing towards making these events happen. Over the past 10 years, Rockcliffe has proven the value of attending conferences virtually. Now it's time to redefine how in-person conferences should differentiate themselves by blending the best that experiential learning and technology have to offer. As part of our effort to help reshape why in-person conferences still should be relevant in a digital age, Rockcliffe University's annual conference will be showcased showcasing practical experiential learning this fall. We will be at the historic Fort Mason Center in San Francisco's Fisherman Wharfs area, November 9th and 10th. Attendees can expect hand, hands-on and networking opportunities, unique learning through experiential activities augmented with technology, all amidst a showcase of tools and strategies for designing learning in a digital age. There is still time to become an active presenter in this year's program by submitting a virtual infographic poster exhibit by August 15th. Part of what we are trying to show with the conference is how to make use of accessible technology supporting adult learner education. What we want to do is support education that is affordable on a teacher's salary and scalable on a student's budget. Our goal is to provide a supportive environment which allows anyone with an interest in education and being of service to others to prototype new ideas and new innovations necessary for understanding the digital literacy skills for a digital future. It's all about sharing in a risk-free and supportive environment to help people get over the steep learning curve that digital literacies tend to present to people both old and new alike. To register for the conference, to become a presenter, or to help sponsor the conference, I've included links below. If you want to get on our early bird registration, time is quickly running out as the early bird registration closes this Sunday evening, June 17th. Plus, you can read up more on what to expect from the conference by visiting our recent article on how to recharge and renew your profession with the right conference. And so, with no further ado, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Zinnia Zober and Brett Linden, who is our featured guest for today. Thank you very much, Dylan. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And Brett, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> uh, so Brett and I are both Washingtonians. I thought I'd mention that first. And I realize that we're kind of kitty corner in the state of Washington. And um, one of the things that I noticed also is that based on social media, we're the same age. And I think that's kind of important to note, being Washingtonians in the same age, because we have similar perspectives, but we also have different perspectives. And that's what makes Second Life so special, right? Absolutely. Awesome. Now, you've had a lot of titles in your day, and I don't know if I want to focus so much on titles, but far more about your experience and your stories. And uh, I'm prepared ahead of time, giving you a little hint of what was going to happen in the hot seat, right? Fire away. I'm ready. All right. All right. <laughs> awesome. Um, and and I hope, Brad, I didn't um, I offend you by disclosing that we're both Washingtonians and the same age. No, not at all. Actually, it's great. 
I should call you neighbor. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's start with my first question. In your experience, how do virtual environments supersede other modes of media to communicate and to motivate positive change? Honestly, where to start? I mean, because there's so much to say. So I'll just sort of yeah, nudge, nudge me in any direction if I go off. But basically, first I would say that uh, there's a, obviously a very positive impact on engaging in social spaces for both virtual worlds uh, that are desktop based, you know, such as Second Life, uh, but also these new headset based virtual reality experiences, Sansar and the many other platforms that are out there. Um, and I think that virtual reality and virtual worlds both um, are not only a means for experiencing ideas outside of our daily lives, but also for connecting for others in, I think what for many turns out to be a safe and comfortable way. Um, and I think it's really a mistake to stereotype why and how one type of person in, as a group necessarily would find value in a virtual community. I think there's a lot of very unique and different and diverse stories and reasons why people log in. However, I will say that it's true that virtual spaces can be a godsend for uh, people to, who have maybe a difficult time uh, socializing in, uh, in, in real spaces. So the idea that there's some sort of comfort or control or safety in virtual spaces for some people is sort of a positive thing. Um, I mean, there's so many things to say, but obviously I know you guys, I think, are going to be talking to, to the folks behind the Virtual Lives documentary um, at some yes. point. Um, yeah, we're going to have them next month. Yeah, so just as a, as a nod to that, uh, you know, Drax, who we've worked with, um, and um, all the people behind that documentary um, really have done a great job, which I'm sure they'll shed light on, and telling the stories of those that are not able-bodied um, to perhaps get something from a virtual experience, a sense of mobility and presence that um, they may not be able to get in the physical space in the same way. I think there's other folks who have phobias or anxiety issues with face-to-face -face interactions that just evaporate in the virtual spaces. Again, there's just it's not fair to categorize and across all use cases here, but those are some that I think that come to light uh, in that documentary. Um, so there's just the perceived idea of safety and control present for when many people communicate via an avatar that just maybe not may not be available in other channels. Um, for example, let me think here. So uh, many SL users choose to only use text chat, even though there may be voice enabled, um, and other people will use voice chat. And sometimes that's determined by the region owners and other times it's culturally determined just that's the norm um, for particular place if you use video chat outside of the virtual spaces people feel in some cases more exposed or vulnerable because they're visually present so facetime or skype may not be an issue for some people but others they may just choose that that's not something for them with sl or virtual worlds you can really craft your identity which brings a lot of fun to that sort of engagement and it also for some people allows them to express themselves you know, and that actually affects the way they communicate and maybe a more optimized sense of their self or an authentic sense of the self. It just varies person to person. And that's just the desktop virtual world experience. I think in, we get even deeper if you talk about some of the headset based social VR spaces um, where that sense of telepresence plays a whole other, you know, uh, layer into the, into the conversation of communication styles. So I could go on and on. I don't want to go too far off in that, but I just think there's a lot to say about it in terms of uh, the differences and why somebody might choose one form of communication versus another and what they get out of it. Absolutely. Well, and you tapped on something that that I like to focus on, it's, you know, the development of one's avatar as a personal brand or a professional brand. And you're right that, you know, depending on the delivery of the, of the message and who's delivering it <laughs> can totally affect it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's actually, uh, you know, I do work with Linden Lab, but I also work in education. And I know that, though I'm not the personal, the one who does this, but a colleague of mine has a VR lab. And as I know, many uh, academic institutes are studying VR and the way that that affects or might open up forms of communication. Um, I know at WSU, um, they're doing focus with particular interest in like environmental issues and political persuasion. Uh, so the way that we communicate and or hear or receive or validate messages, um, which I think is pretty fascinating. So there's just a lot going on. Um, and obviously anyone who searches for Second Life will find, you know, probably thousands at this point 
of search results about all the various academic research to all the nooks and crannies of SL and virtual world communication. So it's just really intellectually, it's just fascinating, right? So, Absolutely. I love it. And I love seeing how it really empowers my students. And as you mentioned, you know, everyone has different f modes of communication. And some of the students that I have that are very shy, you know, just blossom when they come into a virtual world. You find out that they're a total chatty Cathy and you had no idea <laughs> that they were so verbose until they're in an environment where they feel more comfortable. Yeah, I think people feel like they can perhaps express themselves differently, you know, in a way that they might feel more inhibited or introverted perhaps, and then it really lets people come to life. So it's, you know, it's different for everybody, but for a lot of people, that's that's a story I keep hearing again and again, is that the ability to express themselves through an avatar gives a sense of safety and perhaps reinvention or even amplifying their true personality in some cases. So, you know, it's very different person to person, but with students in particular, yeah, I've noticed that too, that students can express themselves. You really see another side of the personality come out, which is kind of fun. Absolutely. Well, while we're thinking about uh, education, here's my next question. So why is there such a high level of commitment and financial investment in Second Life and other virtual platforms by educators and social good advocators Well, okay, so there's a lot to say there. I think it, just to SL first, um, I don't mm -hmm. think it's any, any secret in, in that SL in particular has had its ups and downs in terms of the education community. I think SL, to its credit, was initially embraced very wholeheartedly by many educators. And I and just very candidly think it was a mistake when the lab removed its educator discount a few years later. Really happy that that discount is back. So for those that don't know, there's like a 50% discount to educators and nonprofits on the private region setup and maintenance costs, et cetera. Um, and so we're now 15 years past the uh, introduction of Second Life. So the ed tech space has really evolved and changed dramatically. And there's lots and lots of opportunities for people to explore Second Life in different ways because the platform has evolved. Um, and of course, other platforms as well. And the other thing that's really changed, and I, you know, having been an educator for a decade plus now as well, is that the typical college student, you know, or, and again, I, I, my experience is in a university or college level setting, but um, I've noticed that the time with the change of times, you have now a very savvy, sophisticated student who really gets and understands from the get-go the concept of avatars representing a real person, and versus maybe a decade or so ago in the earlier days of SL there might have been a little bit of a learning curve there, you know, as it wasn't necessarily in the mainstream in the same way. Um, so there are still a lot of schools that are using SL and other platforms quite robustly, uh, in particular for distance learning. And uh, it's really heartening to see how it's being used. I know, I mean, I, you could, we could pick zillions of examples. One that comes to mind that is really indicative of what's happening right now and why that investment is still going on um, in these types of platforms is at the University of Central Florida, their biology department um, actually is using it in a, in a way, or SL specifically in a way that helps to sort of relieve some of the burden of uh, running a really large introductory undergraduate course. So in terms of scaling and reaching a large mass number of students. And in this particular case, they continue to invest in this uh, idea of, the, of having different learning modules built within uh, virtual worlds that basically introduce students module by module, lesson by lesson, to different aspects of the course, you know, content. Um, and so the last I checked, this was like for last year, the data I got on that was that they'd actually served 4,500 students um, annually in this course via the virtual world learning modules, which really scaled well for them to have this engaging, alive course that's dynamic you know, in a virtual world in a way that might not have worked in just a flat, you know, text only based online class experience. And of course that doesn't work for every type of class, every type of content, but when it's done well and when it's done in the, with the right fit of content, with the right people who know what they're doing, it can be magic and work really, really well. Even now, 15 years on, Second Life is still doing this. And of course, a shout out to the other platforms as well. There's lots of uh, developments across the board in this sector. It's pretty impressive. And do you think that it's important for us to be able to share these stories of success to bolster the rest of us who are also working in Second Life and other platforms? Yeah, I mean, any ways, any place that people can evangelize their success stories, 
you know, the sliver of it that I see in my affiliation with Linden Lab is, you know, we have our SLED list where I know there's still people actively engaged there and our educator forums. I know there's other opportunities as well. Um, and I think that just sort of everybody who has an interest and or has experiences that work and don't work, I think it's important to share what doesn't work as well as what does work so that we can kind of build upon that and learn and get better. Um, in my experience, you know, as I mentioned, I, you know, I'm an educator as well. Um, one thing that I did that I loved that I actually, I sort of took a break from it. Now I'm starting to do again with Second Life in particular is we did uh, sort of a mixed reality event where we actually had people flown out physically on campus um, that were really pretty dynamic speakers. We called it the Virtual Journalism Summit. And actually, mm. Philip, Philip Rosedale came out and the founder of Club Penguin at the time, Lane Merrifield, came out. We had a reporter from CNN out. And it was this mixed reality event where um, they spoke about the concept of the, of the stories and cultures and the legitimacy of those stories and communities in, in virtual worlds. Um, and while we did that event, physically on a big stage in an auditorium we actually then also had avatar representatives for each of them and so we sort of you know to set it up and do it the right way was tricky but we ended up having people log in from both the virtual world and actually interacting on stage with the uh, the guests um, later that evening and it happened to be in parallel with uh, a marquee symposium event where we had the late Helen Thomas, the you know legendary journalist, and Bob mm -hmm. Schieffer as well uh, of CBS News. We had avatars for them, which was really fun. Oh, and, uh, great! It was just a kind of a neat experience. But the idea of doing these like mixed reality events where you can kind of extend the audience and have that engagement is something that's kind of neat as well for sort of academic events, education events, that kind of thing. So that's one that I personally worked with as well. That's been fun. That's awesome. I just uh, we got a new IT guy who's going to be helping out at, at our school. And I was just warning him that, you know, we want to do mixed reality opportunities. And, and he was just like, what is that? I'm like, oh, you know, it's so exciting. And, and explain, you know, um, how touching it is, especially when you do conferences and not everyone can participate, that they, you know, they may be able to join us in world and that they're just, you know, as active and there and present with us. And, I, you know, when I talk to educators, I mean, I also teach, you know, college level and, and I'm very fortunate that I have an IT department that supports my efforts. I have a dean, I have a, a vice president and a president who supports the work I'm doing. And when I encounter some other schools, kind of like you've mentioned, that idea of like finding out what not to do or what doesn't work and so forth. And I'm, you know, very, very happy to share the that I'm a very lucky girl in that regard. And it sounds like you're a lucky guy too. Yeah, you know, and honestly, I think it just requires clarity on what you're trying to achieve. You know, I'm sure you've had to sort of give your sort of elevator pitch. Why are we doing this? Why, what's the value, you know, for the education experience? And then of course, you know, in an academic environment, it's just, as with any business there, you have to sort of show the value in what you're doing in terms of the org organization, the entity, and why it could be most successfully implemented in one particular way or one particular platform versus another. Um, with SL, I mean, it, the blessing and the curse of it is it's 15 years in the you know in the making now. So, you know, the blessing of that is it's established. A lot of people are familiar with it, and the curse of it, just candidly, is a lot, there's a lot of shinier, newer things. Um, and so, some people are like, oh, Second Life, 15 years ago, what you know, what about this new shiny thing? So, you know, it just depends on the context of what people are trying to achieve. Um, but SL obviously continues to evolve and get better. Um, and people have had successes and failures, you know, in terms of using SL in an academic environment. Some use cases or experiences are better than others as far as the education, you know, value that it brings. So, Absolutely. And I, I remember that um, SL had an education blog on their site for a while, and they would highlight the different successes that schools would have that would definitely help me you know when I was developing my program I can say check this out they did it can we do it too and they're like oh okay you know <laughs> yeah um, yeah it's, it's that community and sharing so that people really against you know share even though the technical things like how did you get this to happen and so forth like when we did the mixed reality anyone who's done these kind of hybrid events knows you have to sort of think about the audio feeds and how to get it set up so there's not an echo on stage. And I mean, little things like that that become big deal, you know, in the environment when it's real time and the show is on, you don't want those technical issues to sort of disrupt or interrupt. So getting those things set up, I think that's where that knowledge share is really important. Absolutely. So that leads into my next question. How is the transmission of trust 
strengthened by opportunities like physical education conferences and meetings or opportunities to meet your virtual friends. So kind of like what you experienced at your school and then other conferences. Yeah, I think many of us have formed, you know, very real and deep um, professional and personal bonds through our virtual lives. Um, and sometimes it's hard to communicate the value of that or what that feels like to people that are not, you know, users or experienced with, you know, platforms like Second Life. Uh, so it just makes sense that if you are somebody who is, you know, developing true bonds in a virtual environment, that for many people there's an appeal in wanting to meet the man or woman who's behind the avatar, you know, to, to take these social opportunities to meet in the real world. That's not for everybody, though. Some people are perfectly content and for whatever reason just want to keep that connection only in their virtual identities. It just is going to be depending on what people want. Um, I would hope that genuine trust and caring would form as it's earned and with experience as you get to know somebody, just as in the real world, right? In the virtual world, that sort of social protocol is true. Um, so I think for some people, the extra step of meeting in the real world really helps seal the deal and taking perhaps trust to the next level, just seeing a physical presence. Um, and for anyone who's had that experience, it can just be really surreal. I don't know if anyone listening to this has ever had the experience where you've had a um, virtual um, connection with somebody, you've, you know, professionally, whatever it may be, for an extended period of time. And then for whatever reason, there's an event or a conference, and whoa, you're going to meet them face to face. It's just mind blowing and exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think for most people, that's the case. There are some people, again, who don't want to take that leap, and that's fine, too. Um, but I just, uh, you know, I hesitate. I really would say I'd hesitate to say that by taking that extra step, that it does anything different to make that relationship, quote, unquote, real. Because I think that dilutes or, or you know, undermines the integrity and the value of just a virtual-only uh, connection. I mean, there's many of us that work and engage exclusively through our virtual lives. And those are very real, right? And I just wouldn't want to sort of distinguish that as an other. It is part of our experiences, part of our lives. Um, but yes, for people who want to take that leap and do that and, you know, meet face to face, uh, for some people that will help build trust. But I would hope that just like the real world, time and experience and sort of our own, you know, instincts to some degree help us build that trust, whether it be just in world or also crossing over face to face. Absolutely. Yeah, I I love meeting my virtual friends. I've even um, gone to Japan to meet one of my virtual friends as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I was born there, so it, it was a great opportunity to go back and have an excuse to go, go meet him and his family. And I've met a number of my friends across the country. Every time I go to a conference, I try to meet my virtual friends. That's and pretty cool. Yeah, I love it. I love it, definitely. And then they get buttons for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, before I ask the next question that we had lined up, uh, you know, you hit the word real, you know, versus um, virtual. Do you find that, like, people get kind of confused or off-put when we try to explain to them that what we're experiencing in this virtual environment is real? It is an actual thing. Do you find that you use other terms to express the differences between those things? Yeah, I do. And I'll be honest and candid, and I hope that I'm not alone in this. Sometimes I screw that up, right? Because I will just casually, maybe carelessly say, oh, in the real world. And I used to do that a lot more. And actually, I'm trying to remember who it was. We had, uh, I, don't, I don't know him personally, but there was uh, the gentleman who worked with Drax on this documentary. His name's Tom and he's one of the educators. He has a really val valid point. He's published about the importance of not segmenting or, or distinguishing real from the online. And so like when I heard him make a presentation about sort of, I don't wanna say der the derogatory nature of using the word real, but just how that might be damaging for some people or, or maybe demeaning of you know, the actual intensity and authenticity of the virtual only, you know, uh, experiences that really resonated with me. And so I started to check myself, you know, of course, working with Lyndon and also working in the education space, I want to be highly aware of, you know, when we use a certain word choice, the connotation of that and how that might be different person to person and to be lazy and use a shortcut and say, oh, that's the real world. 
uh, really for many people understandably is dismissive of the validity and the, um, you know, again, the authenticity of their virtual only experiences. I still slip up though, and occasionally almost, and will just inter- lazily interchangeably say, oh, the real world as opposed to in world. And that's my bad. That's, I shouldn't do that. And, um, I hope I'm much better at it. You know, it's one of those things where people who are not familiar with these kinds of relationships and the dynamics of a virtual encounters, will likely not understand that and it would take a, an education for them to really understand why you know there's maybe sensitivity in ge- overgeneralizing and use of that so yeah absolutely yeah i i know that when people you know when i first started over 10 years ago you know you'd always hear the the real or, or rl compared to sl and i've i don't really know the difference you know <laughs> Um, and so, um, I've tried very hard to use, you know, say the physical world compared to the virtual, um, but it is tricky and we, and we want to be careful with the words we use. So I, I appreciate that, um, you're being candid about your experiences utilizing it. And I think it's something that, um, often when also talking to people, when you explain what second life is, they make some comment about like your first life and, and it's sad because again, you know, the simple word can put some sort of opinion that is negative on people's experiences. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. The words have meanings, you know, whether we intend to assign that to them or not culturally, or you may inherit the baggage of a word that's sort of an accepted definition of it. Um, and I think that's the thing when we say real, then the, op- the implication is that the virtual is not real, right? In the sense that uh, the human experiences and bonds and, uh, you know, cultures and communities within them are f- as, if, as if they are less than, which of course they are not. So that's the reason why I try to avoid um, using "quote unquote" real world or in real life versus in world. That's excellent. So let me go into our next question. With global access to limitless, dedicated learners and volunteers, how has your definition of integrity been altered? Well, I think there's a huge shift underway. Um, at many colleges and, and schools to improve the quality of online instruction and to expand more and more. There's like a pressure and an and incentive to have more and more education offerings um, offered online. And even from a business perspective, online learning is, offers a huge opportunity for both the profit-based and state uh, or non-profit-based uh, schools. So as an educator, there's a pretty good chance that your organization may be asking anyone who's in that space to teach online at some point. And building a good online course isn't just a matter of cut and pasting content from lecture notes online. The faculty needs to engage with their students, whether it be virtual worlds or other platforms that allow for that beyond just, again, cut and paste text. Um, And this is getting to your point about integrity, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, Regardless of the platform, I think one of the biggest challenges is maintaining the integrity of the course content itself, so the value of and the quality of the education experience, uh, and then also the integrity of making sure that there's no cheating in the class. So it depends on how you're defining integrity, I guess. Um, I think there's this, um, as an educator, and again, anyone who's in that field would probably attest, there's this this situation that we're all dealing with right now, at least I know I've dealt with it, where there's a temptation by some upper administrators to get quote, more quote unquote butts and seats, more more enrollment based, you know, funding basically. So they get paid uh, based on per student enrollment. And so that means those larger class sizes and, and frankly, many times fewer resources to manage the higher workload as, an, as, an, as a teacher. You've all of a sudden go from like 40 to 80 students, not only in a physical class, but maybe an online class. So how do you maintain integrity in that environment, right? It's tough because you've got this pressure more so that there can be a financial model that works for that entity. Uh, but then you're the teacher and you want to make sure the education assignment or the assignments bring in, you know, truly uh, are valued and valuable and that they be graded correctly. So you have these temptations to, you could be presented with cutting a corner to make the assignments easier, maybe less frequent, so there's less grading. Do you turn to on automatically graded exams in lieu of, in lieu of uh, writing-based exams to make that take a lot more time to evaluate? So the integrity of the classroom experience is just challenged, I think. I don't know if this resonates with anyone listening to this, but I know, again, for me, as somebody who has taught online, 
Um, that has been the evolution or de-evolution perhaps in some cases in the last 10 years in terms of the education uh, environment and what we have to deal with, the reality of sort of strained resources and this demand for more for less. Um, and really being sensitive to not compromise the quality of the education and the integrity of the course and also to sort of have checks in place that ensure that students uh, are not you know, doing fraudulent things. You know, in other words, making sure that it's in an online environment, keeping the integrity of um, evaluation correct, you know, so that you don't have people come in and say they're one person and do the work for somebody else and then turn it in. And those are complicated, probably beyond the scope of this conversation, but I would just say it's real tough. It is really, really tough. Um, you know, as empl employers want to know that the degree that gets minted or issued represents a demonstration of mastery of the key skills, critical thinking, and accomplishment. So if that online-based education degree is not viewed as having integrity or it's watered down, then the whole credibility of that program can be questioned. So that's just a complicated question. I don't know if I've answered it successfully, but um, it's one I definitely, and I've seen my peers grapple with all the time. Absolutely, yeah, no, great answer, great answer. And uh, it's one of the things that I think you, you're right about that, you know, we have some new struggles to deal with, especially when we teach online and in person, that my classes are like that. Um, that I have both environments to work with. And um, what I find, you know, when it comes to integrity within the virtual realm is that quite often I think people step up to the plate and are successful and, you know, tend to have a higher level of professionalism because they know that they have to represent themselves as truthful as possible and that there's going to be uh, evidence online <laughs> of it for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right that we also have to struggle with the fact that um, some folks are more focused on how many students we have in the classroom compared to the quali quality experiences the students have with us. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the people that I work with, the other faculty members, et cetera, like there's some people that are, love the online environment. They love the challenge of it. They found ways to make that work successfully for them. And there's other faculty members like, nope, I don't want to teach online. You know, they have absolutely opposed to it unless they're you know forced to do so. Um, so some of it's driven by sort of the incentives or the um, personality types, I guess, at play as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but definitely the field, the, academic, the education field is changing, no question about it. More and more and more um, outlets, both for-profit, of course, but also the sort of state-based uh, education units. And of course, I'm talking only about the, um, you know, the um, university level stuff, but of course, there's applications beyond that level. But, um, but more of that's going online than ever. Absolutely. Um, so, I also think about uh, the idea of integrity is, can you rely on people? And, yeah. and quite often I think people are confused of how much we do trust and rely on and believe in the people that we work with in a virtual environment. Have you experienced that with working with Linden Lab and other colleagues in World? Yeah, I guess, and that's a different way. I mean, again, sort of interpreting the meaning of when you talk about integrity in different mm -hmm. ways. I think from that, in that context, um, you know, I, I think different people have different experiences. You know, you hope, it's just like in, in, you know, the physical world, you encounter people that are extremely reliable. You know you can trust them. And they, they usually over time, you know, you've built up that bond and so forth. And then there are people that are flakes and they disappoint you. <laughs> it's mm, frustrating. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like the real world. I, I just did it. And they're like so the charming. Anyway, yeah. So, but yeah, but I mean, so both in the virtual environments and the physical worlds, I think there are people that are going to be reliable and not. And so I guess maybe, you know, one way to think of this too is to what degree does, if we're talking about a virtual world, you know, variable, to what degree does a virtual world, you know, aspect of this contribute, amplify, increase or decrease the likelihood, excuse me, likelihood that somebody would be reliable or not. That's a complicated question. It's interesting. I don't know. Anecdotally speaking, I've not had any experiences on the negative side that, you know, would cause, you know, concern for me, but I'm sure people have stories. You know, I hope again, that the human aspect, the fact that, you know, as humans, we are all different and those qual qualities perhaps get amplified a bit in the world sometimes. Um, 
whether they're more reliable or less reliable. It's probably dependent on the core of the person itself. Absolutely. Well, I know I've been spoiled by getting to work with such amazing professional creative folks who are not afraid to answer my crazy questions. Are you ready for the next one? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Um, how will you foster acceptance and inclusion through your work as an educator and virtual world marketing champion? Well, it's the year 2018, right? So mm -hmm. we'd hope that there'd be more acceptance and understanding of different cultures and viewpoints and communities. But sadly, it doesn't often feel that way. I mean, again, I'm going to you know, go into politics, but certainly the environment right now is very divisive and um, there's a lot of uh, feelings that people are not being heard. Um, so I think as an educator, you do your best to try to check your own biases and foster a safe inclusive learning environment, whether it's online or in person. I think many universities and schools are implementing initiatives with a true, genuine uh, attempt to help. And I still think there's a lot of work to do there, though. Um, as someone who's also experienced in virtual world marketing, um, I think that from that level, it means being more aware of what images and messages are used in marketing campaigns. Um, specific to Linden Lab, I think they can and should do better. Uh, I think the company itself, in terms of the employees, is amazingly inclusive as a wide range of uh, employees that represent different cultures, religions, ethnic backgrounds, orientations, I mean, across the gamut. Uh, I've never seen a more diverse workforce, actually, which is a pleasure um, to have an affiliation with. I think um, in terms of the marketing and the representation, some historically of the campaigns probably have been too vanilla. And I know that the company mm -hmm. and my role in it especially is to really work to be aware of that and change that to, for better representation across the board. Um, and as an example, I mean, I don't just want to throw out one token example, yeah. but, but one that is current to this week actually is the homepage of secondlife.com will um, be shifting to LGBT pride, which of course it's June now, mm -hmm. and yeah. there's a lot of that. And actually it's not just this year, that's happened in the past as well. And so there'll be a lot of initiatives. Actually there's landing pages, a dedicated paid acquisition campaign specific to LGBT issues um, in partnership um, with, well not, I shouldn't say in partnership with, but we've contacted the uh, organizers of Second Pride um, to make them aware of the fact that we're gonna drive a little bit more traffic this year um, officially from Linden Lab, which I think is pretty cool. And I think that's just a start. I mean, there's just so much to do and hopefully it'll get better. Excellent. How, how can we help you in that process? Well, uh, people can reach out to me directly. Um, there is a general press contact uh, alias or email that goes to actually the, not all, but most of the marketing team, which I'll just put the uh, email out and it's just press contact at lindenlab.com. So P-R-E-S-S -S, and then contact, press contact at lindenlab.com. Myself, the uh, people that on both stands are NSL actually get receive that and that's the marketing team that gets that. So I think if there's ideas, I mean obviously productively looking for um, ideas or pointing us to communities that might be worth, um, you know, uh, showcasing in, in various ways. There's so many promotional levers that can be pushed um, you know, everything from the homepage, again, in representation there, to the destination guide, to the login screen message of the day. That's when you fire up the viewer, the little text only message that pops up. Actually, gets a lot of clicks. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm probably skipping a few, but there is social media, of course. I and mean, so there's different ways. Um, I just think that there's more to do there. That's great. Well, I know that a lot of people will want to be able to support your efforts and showcasing how special and innovative um, Second Life and, and now coming with Sansar as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think as the, the people that are here at Linden Lab really have good intentions and they make every effort to try to be aware of the diversity, aware of the different communities, things that don't just reflect with their own personal culture you know, and our makeup is, but what are what they see around them, you know, not only in the company, since it is so diverse, but in the communities. Um, so I think there's a good intent there. I think that sometimes, like again, like many companies, it's not just this one, they'll miss the mark. And I think that's, again, where the work needs to get, to improve, you know, um, for that. So yeah, any 
ideas that people have, just shoot an email out and um, that will help us at least maybe even be aware of something that we're not aware of. Awesome. That's great. So um, I wanted to open up to the audience for a few questions. Would that be all right? Sure. Okay. Um, so does anyone have any questions? You can type them in chat. Okay. Go for it, Dally. And and just to remind you guys that you want to type it in chat because we can't hear in world as we're filming. And and if anyone else has a question, feel free. Okay, excellent. So, what do you see as the future of VR and virtual worlds. It's from Dal. Well, okay. Oops. Let me. Sorry, had my mic off there. Uh, so I think not everyone is going to have an interest in or desire to experience VR. Just starting with the VR piece of this. Um, mm -hmm. But I and I'm, I'm probably speaking to you know people that have already experienced it. So maybe it's a you know bias room here. But I do encourage everyone to at least check it out, or at least if you have encounter a naysayer to try to find a gentle way to have them experience it before judging it. Um, you know, as anyone who's experienced VR in particular knows, the first time you put on, the novelty of the first time you put on that VR headset, assuming you're experiencing a, a good VR experience, it can be mind-blowing. Like, I just remember, I mean, I just wanted to tell everybody, the first time I experienced the sort of presence and the mind being tricked, I just was like, oh my gosh, this is really something. I was completely sold on it um, in a way that's really hard to communicate other than people hearing your enthusiasm unless you experience it. I mean, we're a little now, you know, a couple, two or three years on from sort of Oculus sort of, you know, becoming into mainstream awareness here. So of course, I think a lot of people have experienced that now. So now the, where do we go next, right? So if it's a well-created VR app or experience, you do really feel transported to a different place. And that idea of telepresence um, that kind of tricks the mind to thinking you're somewhere that you're not. I mean, I really think it's a matter of now that we understand that that is a possibility is how to improve both the hardware and the software so that that, that wow moment, you know, it, you know it, it, the novelty of that first wow moment extends into something that is not only, you know, exciting still because the novelty wears off at a certain point um, to being practical um, and or entertaining or informative or inspiring, you know, all those things we look for both in VR and virtual worlds. Um, I think that one of the key myths that people have is that, and again, specific to VR is that it's just a trend. It's very tempting to sort of you know, buy into the idea that there's a hype cycle and then it's going to go away because, you know, you see waves of ups and downs and ebbs and flows. Um, I just think that the industry is just still getting started. You know, I think it's still very, very early days. And there's some crude VR experiences that years from now we'll look back and go, oh, my God, just like you look back at old cell phones, the first old timey. <laughs> yeah, old timey, right? And some of them are so, they're like big bricks and blocky. And then we think about the first wave of VR headsets. And, you know, already you're seeing leaner, thinner, lighter, more comfortable ones. But that's nothing compared to where we'll be in a few years, right? It's just time and technology will make these things better and more accessible. Um, and the software will get better, you know, and so on. So I think it's really, really promising. I'm also, of course, really excited about AR. You mentioned uh, the question I think was, about the future trends and so forth. And I think that it's worth acknowledging that not just the VR, but also augmented reality, um, the idea that you're not walled off from your immediate environment with a headset, you can actually see through it, which for a lot of people is a, distract or a, a detractor, or, you know, detracting for them. So they'll, they don't like the idea of putting something on that uh, deprives them of their actual real or, you know, immediate environment around them. So AR sort of solves that, you know, allowing you to see around, but also have layered over your, um, what you witness with, you know, other interactive elements. Um, the other myth too is that VR is expensive. I think that if we're looking at the future, some of these pricey headsets, we've already seen the prices come down substantially. And you'll see a lot more as well. So, you know, entry level VR is free, You're going down to the cheapy cardboard viewers that are almost like giving away what on cereal boxes. I don't know. I mean, they're so cheap and ubiquitous now. And the New York Times like sent them out to subscribers for free in the mail unsolicited. So, like those mm -hmm. entry level, low, no cost 
viewers are certainly out there, but time will show that the technology will get better, hardware, software, and it'll get um, you know cheaper for people to access the higher power, higher quality experiences as well. So who knows? Who knows? But uh, and I, you know, listen, um, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, dare say that I have the answers on this stuff, but I do think that history shows us that a lot of times technology will get better and more accessible. Um, but you know, good experiences need to be built. You know, and people need to find a reason to want to experience it. And I guess I focus too much on VR. I think with virtual worlds, you know, again, we're in the 15th year for Second Life, and I think many naysayers back in the day during the hype cycle of the earlier days of Second Life would be shocked, you know, after sort of the rise and then sort of slight decline and so forth. The fact that Second Life is still viable this many years on um, has defied, I think, a lot of people's expectations and again, other virtual worlds as well. So I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, how not just this platform, but other platforms continue to evolve as a category um, so that we can all, you know, benefit from that. Excellent. So I have another question from Shiny, what a great name. We were just talking about that. <laughs> um, so Shiny asked, I'm a new citizen and I'm extremely excited about the whole universe here and its potential. I am a citizen journalist and think my journalism by mixed media type of journalism. Do you have any advice for a new reporter on the scene? Oh, I love that question. Um, Advice. Um, there's a couple of different ways to answer that. I think one is to think about the context or the you know the type of reporting that you're doing as far as reporting the cultures and the communities inside and from within, if you will, the virtual world VR environments. As everybody knows, you know, who's active in SL and other virtual worlds, there's these stories. I mean, this is one of the things I've been a big advocate for is the Virtual Journalism Summit that we did is the idea that legitimizing and making people aware of the stories and the communities and having those treated with fairness and, um, you know, equal integrity as those stories would be treated in the physical world. And that, you know, not be just a novel quirk. It's the fact that these are legitimate, real experiences, as we talked about earlier. So I think one is an, there's an edu there's not enough people who cover this sector that understand that sensitivity and the legitimacy of the realness of the stories in the communities, and that they're valid and worthy of coverage. Um, I mean, not every you know, moment in time is worthy of coverage, but just like the criteria you would use to determine is something newsworthy in the physical world, there are events and um, things that occur inside virtual spaces that you would use the same criteria for. Is it worthy of coverage? The fact that next week um, SL15B opens up and that there is multiple regions where creators are actually putting these amazing creations together that then are going to be torn down at the end of it. You know, that's an event. And there's new stories around that. The fact that there are human experiences and, um, you know, things that occur inside Second Life that might be great human interest stories. And so I just think there aren't enough people to tell those stories. So one way of, of answering that question is from within within Second Life and with as a reporter who's immersed, and I shouldn't say just Second Life, virtual worlds more generically perhaps, but um, you know, understanding that and not just treating it as a gimmick or novelty and just being respectful. I just think that's lacking. There aren't enough people that know that. And then the other side of it is treating it from outside. So somebody who is covering sort of generically the plat you know, the the platforms and the developments for that. But I'm more fascinated by the internal stuff, like the being immersed in the communities and reporting almost like an embedded journalist inside SL or whatever it may be. I think that's, there's just not enough of that. Yes, absolutely. That's a great suggestion. Okay. Next question this is actually from one of my students. Corey asks, is there any possibility of integrating SL with companies that create gaming consoles like PlayStation and Xbox? I am not the right person to answer that credibly because I'm not the developer <laughs> here. I'm in mark, you know, I do marketing stuff, but um, <laughs> I will say that that converse, that has come up obviously, and it, certainly it's been thought about. Um, I think that's fair to say. Um, I'm not pri I'm not privy to nor really in the right place to sort of disclose what sort of uh, non-public 
developments may occur. What I what you can expect, I will say this. What I, you can expect that I can say is that there was a sort of essentially a roadmap of fifteen things, improvements, et cetera, that the company is, has publicly identified that, that we are committing to doing, things like return of last names, um, linen, another batch of linen homes that sort of is better changing in some of the pricing models. Those are some of the things that there was a, a public blog about that Ebe, um, our CEO, um, spoke about publicly, and, it, and we're staying true to that in the effort to sort of stake to that. But when we talk about platforms like, you know, the PlayStation um, 4 and you know, Xbox, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's not on that roadmap publicly, but of course the company is always looking at where and how to, ex- you know, extend the reach of it. There's a lot of technical reasons why that hasn't happened. As I'm sure many people are aware, it's, you know, not easy to just port something over in that way without disrupting the ecosystem, you know, um, because there's a whole economic ecosystem. And so anything that happens, we have to be very careful about that doesn't uh, interfere with or jeopardize that nature, the nature of how people, you know, what people rely on for Second Life in terms of their businesses uh, and their existing content. So that's the best I can do in answering that one. That's a good one. Good job, Corey. Stumping them. That, that's what I teach them. <laughs> <laughs> the hard questions. Um, yeah, the hard questions. Um, but, so I had a private uh, inquiry by Lady, and I'm going to put it in chat for you. So she's asking... Um, in regards to the education community, what are the top three reasons to, given as major challenges for schools to invest in a complete degree engaged campuses in Second Life or satellite? So, like as if they're satellites for their brick and mortar. Yeah, it's tough to say the top three. I mean, on general, I'll state some of the things that I think are the value propositions. And again, it isn't going to work for everybody. I'm not here blindly evangelizing, you know, SL is the right thing for every educator in online. I'm not saying that blindly, um, you know, wearing a company hat, if you will. So I think what I would say is looking at the case studies of what has worked, talking to your peers um, and finding where those successes and failures have been um, and seeing where that might map over to what is right for your situation. Um, things that I've seen have been that have been successful, some have, some have taken some investment in time, um, not just in money, but also in terms of uh, development and planning it out and mapping it out correctly. In the most crude or basic way, you know, people can communicate just by jumping in world and having sort of real-time chat. And in some cases, you see a very um, basic use of Second Life in education where it's like a, a simulated classroom. There's a, there's a stated time and place that people go and they use the group voice, you know, um, communication aspect of Second Life, and that's how that goes. Other cases, people will use sort of the the media and surfaces or medium on a prim, um, you know, to actually embed lectures. Again, almost simulating or mapping over what you can do in a physical class, but bringing people in distributed places together. So certainly, that is one thing that the platform enables pretty stri- in a straightforward way. Um, but in a more complex answer, I'd say there's also um, those that have the time and patience and or skills to do so, there are like scripted, simulated uh, learning and immersive experiences and environments that can be created uniquely in Second Life, I think, that um, bring to life this sense of understanding um, of a concept. So everything from the, virt- I mean, for example, I have a passion for uh, my weakness, if you will, is the virtual uh, museums. Like I love mm, yeah. wandering through and, 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 and some of them are interactive, which is really awesome. And so sort of you might not be able to physically get to those uh, exhibits, but you can have sort of um, an equivalent of it. There's been some scripted um, learning ones. This is an old one, but like I love, what was it? The uh, virtual hallucination, hallucin- I can't oh, say hallucinations, yeah. excuse me. Yeah. yeah, Like that one that sort of, um, from an is building of empathy point of view, the idea that you would go in and, you know, you can read about this stuff, you know, you can watch, you know, films, you know, about it or whatever, but by sort of immersing yourself and experiencing it in a 3D experience, especially when you're with other people, um, is a shared experience. And that's a way that it turns on, you know, part of the neurons or whatever for learning, you know, in a way that's different things, you know, you learn and experience things differently. So I think that it isn't for everybody. It isn't for every use case, but I think that there's enough, precedent now with 15 years of educated use where people know what works and know what doesn't work. And I don't think anyone needs, you know, a company representative to tell them that. I think that the community itself shares notes on the good and the bad and the ugly of where virtual worlds shine and or are problematic. 
um, for whatever the learning objectives are. Do you think that the communities here are more than happy to share their pros and cons with anyone that comes in? I hope so. I mean, you know, there are some known, I mean, in fact, I would love to learn if I'm missing some of the key resources and or if we can help amplify or shine light on uh, some of them, that would be great too. Certainly on the community boards within the Second Life website, there is an education forum. There's the SLED lists, as mentioned. I know there's some um, specific community get-togethers and so forth as well. Um, again, not just SL, but other platforms as well. So I, need, I know people are sharing those notes as well. Um, so I hope people are willing to share. I mean, especially as educators, I mean, by nature of the job definition itself is that we educate not just students, but ourselves and each other, our peers, um, to be better. So I know that, again, for better, for, well, I think mostly for the better, um, the fact that, uh, you know, I have worked in the academic sector myself personally for, you know, a decade plus, um, I've got a weakness for, you know, the education community in the sector. And so in terms of internal awareness within the company, and where it fits into the roadmap. I mean, not that my voice is going to be the only one heard, no, obviously, but but it's something something that certainly, whenever I can sort of shed light on, hey, well, what about this, you know, and thinking about or throwing something in that direction, I, I'll always try to to work that in when I can, you know. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Well, that's one reason why we're in our profession is that we continue to learn, right? Yeah, it never stops. It never stops. And, you know, I think as educators, you can't just recycle the same thing over and over and over. It's, you know, anyone who's teaching knows that, you know, a lot of the fields that, that we teach require us to be engaged in the professional community as well, which is not easy to do, you know, and to stay on top of the latest trends. Actually, one of the classes that I teach is a social media um, persuasion course. And, um, oh, my God, there's no textbook that you can rely on in that space because it just changes every year. You know, you talk about whatever's in vogue one year, the next year, the tech, you know, the interface will change or the way you use it or the algorithms change. I mean, it's all in flux constantly. I just can't even imagine teaching the same way I did five years. The content has changed. Absolutely. I've had the good fortune of teaching over 20 years college level and I love learning new stuff and how things change, but it's impossible to have textbooks for any of my classes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's an investment, but it's worth it. You know, it's worth it for not only us personally, you know, so that we stay, you know, aware of things, but also for the students. Absolutely. Well, Brett, this has been delightful. Is there anything that you would like to end on? Um. I'm just really thankful and, and grateful that you guys invited me to be here. Um, thank you. And um, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I would just also close by saying that uh, to some of the top, the many topics that came up, if there is follow-up, uh, there's a couple of ways that people can reach out privately. Um, one is to me directly. So that's just uh, the email is brett at lindenlab.com. Um, happy to you know address questions that perhaps didn't come up in this, um, and then if in terms of marketing feedback in general, um, you can reach out to press contact at lindenlab.com. Excellent. Those are wonderful um, resources to give folks, and that you've been very inviting and encouraging to them to reach out to you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being here. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. I'd also like to thank. Um, Rockcliffe University for hosting inside the Avatar Studio. And I'd like to thank all of the folks that helped make this happen. You guys are amazing. And I really appreciate all of you joining us today. We'll be uh, back next month, July 11th, with the folks that have, have created a wonderful documentary. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, I know that Bevan's going to... Oh, there she goes. <laughs> That's why we're an awesome team. Bevan shared with us that you'll be able to learn more about the documentary, Our Digital Selves, My Avatar is Me, with the makers of it. And if you haven't seen the feature film, please do. Did I just give them homework? I think so. But good homework. Yeah, very good homework. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.